Welcome everybody to the International Switch Energy Case Competition Finals. Um, this competition is brought to you by Switch Energy Alliance with support from Chuck and Kathy Williamson and the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. My name is Olivia Rickert and I'm an intern at Switch Energy Alliance. And I'm joined by Mary Tibbetts, the Manager of Education Programs at Switch Energy Alliance and Saeed Talhatir Mazi, a volunteer with SWITCH. We have spent the last five months collaborating with the entire SWITCH team to organize this incredible opportunity for teams around the world to come together and tackle the issue of energy poverty. Um, the five finalist teams here today are part of the 270 teams from 37 countries that registered to compete this year. Yes, thank you, Olivia. Um, it's an incredible achievement to be one of the five finalist teams. The competition from the preliminary round and semifinalist teams was very fierce. Our preliminary and semifinalist judges were incredibly impressed with all of the proposals they reviewed, but they deemed the proposals of our five finalist teams to be the strongest. Our judges for the finals have already reviewed 10 minute proposal videos from the finalists. Now the finalist teams will have the opportunity to further impress our judges and compete for a total prize package of $25,000 USD. Each team will begin with their presentation. Each team will begin their presentation with a three minute summary of their proposal, after which the team will be asked approximately three questions by the judges during a 10 minute question and answer session. Following the end of each team's Q&A, the judges will take two to three minutes to score the teams. After all five teams present, we will total the judges' scores and announce the results. And now I'd like to introduce our STEAM panel of judges for the finals. Dr. Lorena Moscardelli um, is our first judge. Dr. Moscardelli is a research scientist and leader of the State of Texas Advanced Resource Recovery Program, also known as the STAR program at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Her expertise is in seismic geomorphology interpretation, sedimentology and stratigraphy, and geoscience data integration. She received a degree in geological engineering from the Central University of Venezuela and a PhD in geological sciences from the University of Texas at Austin. Prior to working at the Bureau, Dr. Moscardelli worked as an exploration geologist for PDVSA and was a principal researcher at Equinor. Her Bureau career includes the co-funding and co-direction of the Quantitative Plastic Laboratory and serving as the leader of the STAR program. Most recently, Dr. Moscardelli has taken a strong interest in understanding the role of geoscience research as part of the ongoing energy transition while contributing to STAR's main mission of conducting geologic research resulting in the increase of production and profitability of energy resources in the state of Texas. Thank you for joining us today. And our next judge is Dr. Ahmad K. Pockrell. Uh, Dr. Pockrell teaches environmental health sciences in the MPH curriculum at the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his MS and PhD degrees from the University of California, Berkeley. His research has focused on environmental and occupational health related to household energy generation and uses in developing countries. His research has appeared in many high impact peer reviewed journals. Recently, he led and completed the Clean Cooking Alliance slash UN Foundation funded action re, uh, research, maximizing the health benefits of clean cooking in peri urban Nepal. He has appeared on TV interviews and the Switch Energy Alliance educational documentary Switch On. Dr. Pockrell's Switch On appearance can also be seen in Switch On the series, episode one, Modern Cooking Fuels which shows how developing countries, including Nepal, are transitioning to modern fuels. Thank you, Dr. Pockrell, for joining us today. And then our final jo uh, judge is Rob Stoner. Dr. Stoner is the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at the MIT Energy Initiative and Founding Director of the MIT Tata Center for Technology and Design. He also serves on the MIT Energy Council, the Science and Technology Committee of the U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the Rockefeller Foundation funded Global Commission to End Energy Poverty, and as president of the International Conservation Fund. Dr. Stoner earned his bachelor's degree in engineering physics from Queen's University in Canada and his PhD in condensed matter physics from Brown University. 
Dr. Stoner is a serial entrepreneur and the inventor and co-inventor of numerous computational and ultra-fast optical measurement techniques. From 2007 through 2009, he lived and worked in Africa and India while serving in a variety of senior roles within the Clinton Foundation, including as the CEO of the Clinton Development Initiative. For the past decade, his research at MIT has been at the intersection of energy, techn energy technology, society, and computation, with an emphasis on power system design, optimization, and regulation in developing countries. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you to all our judges. Um, I think now it's time to introduce the finalist teams. And here are our top five finalists. We have Team 101, Energizers 4 uh, from Egypt. Team 107, Print Energy from Algeria. Team 122, Energy Caribbean Alliance from Colombia. Team 133, ZAS from Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. And Team 151, Urge Affinity from India. And first to present will be Team 101, Energizers 4. You will have three minutes to give your summary um, and you can now unmute and share your screen, Team 101. the screen clear? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Abdullah from the, the Team 101 Energizers 4, and I'll be taking you uh, through our thought process uh, of developing South Sudan Vision uh, 2051. First of all, we, uh, we wanted to choose South Sudan because it's one of the most recently formed countries in the world, and uh, it has one of the lowest uh, electrification rates uh, technically, like one uh, one percent of the of the total population has access to electricity, and it has very low structure, so uh, its energy needs is kind of ultimate. Now we can turn uh, we can turn to the solution methodology uh, to account for uh, energy security for such a developing country. We um, we chose to work with uh, all the all the all the sources that has a very that has a good potential around around the country like um, solar, geothermal, oil, uh, wind, and uh, hydropower. Uh, these sources are then uh, ordered uh, according to their, um, uh, to their reliability, uh, with factors taken into consideration like construction time, lifetime, rating hours, population, and energy generation growth. We also uh, calculated the capital expenditure, expenditure costs for each one, and then we came out with the, um, with the quantitative metric to uh, rate every one of them on the list, uh, which is the beneficial per dollar. Combining the efficiency and cost point of view, we uh, gave each of the sources uh, a percentage of the contribution of the energy generation along the decades from now on, from now, from now on to, uh, to, th to uh, 2051. Uh, this graph here uh, represents our um, trend line for the uh, development of the uh, uh, percentage of contribution of each uh, energy source along the way Toward, uh, towards uh, 2051. In our timeline, we aim to eliminate, to totally, um, to uh, significantly uh, eliminate oil contribution to the energy uh, energy uh, production, so that we can uh, get the pollution down in South Sudan. And thus, we will start with training and raising awareness for renewables via workshops and sessions. And then, uh, at the last stage, we'll be uh, hopefully uh, reaching the level where we where we cut out or we cut down dependence on oil to the least. Uh, in order to uh, strengthen the relations with the neighboring countries in Africa, we chose uh, some providers of the solar panels from uh, neighboring African startups so that we can strengthen continental relations and, la and rapidly stabilize infrastructure plans. We also made sure that the project meets uh, some criteria such as vis visibility, diverse energy sources, and sustainability, and also uh, cope with the, uh, the outcomes of the COP26 agenda for the climate change uh, concerns. And finally, we chose some, uh, some, some funding organizations and gave them a percentage of the, uh, of the total budget, uh, depending on their investment share in renewable energy in the re most, recent, uh, most recent projects. And here comes the, bus the budget distribution. We Sorry made sure to interrupt, that- Sorry but that's time. Okay. That's the three minute time. 
Okay. Thank you for your summary. Um, we'll now begin the Q&A portion. Dr. Moscadelli, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Uh, first, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this. Um, great job, uh, Team 101. Uh, I, I was reviewing your slides uh, the, the other day, and I, I have a question for you. I noticed that in your economic analysis uh, plan, uh, you didn't include any uh, OPEX or, or CAPEX uh, for the oil and, and gas sector. So, but, but still your, your energy mixed, uh, if, if I'm not getting this incorrectly, I mean, by 2030, you are still dependent on 80% on, on oil and gas. And you also pointed out that oil and gas infrastructure in South Sudan is, is uh, in need of, of, of investment. So what was the rationale behind that? And, and uh, can you expand a little bit on, 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 on that aspect? Actually, we thought we, on the, on the way towards 2051, we made sure that uh, the oil percentage will be cut down to the least uh, until we reach uh, 2051. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't exactly calculate the CAPEX or OPEX because that um, in the recent um, in the recent uh, in the recent in the recent period, we couldn't expect how the how uh, importing and exporting oil will be going uh, with the trend line of increasing uh, renewable resources. Do you, you think there is going to be uh, needed investment on that sector? How do you how do you account for that on your on your budget? On the oil sector? Yeah. We will not be working on oil sector. We will basically be working with off-grid systems at first, and then transferring to the other renewable resources. So you're not oil, taking, so you're yes. not taking oil and gas into the mix. Then yes, we are just working for the renewables. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pockerel. If you'd like to take the next question. Yeah. Thank you very much. I yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Um, I have a, I have, I'm from a health background, so I have one uh, question. Uh, you have selected solar energy among others uh, as an intervention to address energy poverty. Um, yes. As you know, a, a solar energy system requires lead acid batteries uh, to store energy. Mm -hmm. um, and when lead acid batteries reach the end of their life after two or you know five years, the educate plans are needed uh, uh, to prevent lead pollution. So is there any plan to address this issue or considering um, anything uh, in this regard? Uh, okay, the proposal is that we will start by uh, using off-grid systems and then transfer to on-grid systems to, uh, in order to provide um, the, uh, the uh, in order to provide the, the most number uh, uh, capable, the most number of people. And then along the way with the revenue we, get, we gain from the uh, solar energy, like taxes or something, uh, then we will uh, we'll be shifting to, uh, towards other sources like wind and hydropower as, uh, as clarified in the plan. So do we have any plan uh, related to how we'll manage the batteries that would be used uh, to store energy? The batteries? Yeah, batteries, yeah. Is that um, I, think I think the batteries just works with the off-grid systems. And as, we, as long as we shift to the on-grid systems, there, were, there will be no, uh, no more need for the batteries. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. And then Dr. Stoner, next question, please. Hey, thank you, Mary. Um, good to be with you all. Um, and, and congratulations on a really nice proposal and, and discussion. I was a little bit confused by your, your rate of rolling the program out seemed to me that in a, in a country with such low access, where there, there's a great opportunity to deploy off-grid solar, which you point out, uh, that, that you, don't, you could do that much, much faster than your plan seems to indicate you're, you have in mind. You, you talk about a 10-year public awareness campaign and not really ramping up solar uh, su substantially until the middle of the century. Am, am I getting that wrong or can you explain? No, you are, you are, you are getting that right, but uh, in the first 10 years or so, the, uh, the deployment of, uh, of solar systems will not be that easy because the country is totally dependent, uh, totally dependent on oil imports at the, uh, at the, at the moment. And um, the oil uh, at, in the country itself uh, is waiting for foreign investors. That is, it is not, it's not yet fully uh, exploited. So that the, uh, the deployment of, uh, so of to total off-grid uh, off solar energy systems in the uh, houses 
will not be uh, totally available until uh, until at least 10 years of the beginning of the project. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for additional questions. Um, if someone has a follow up question they would like to ask this team. Well, can I just keep going then? Because I'm, I'm sure. still unclear okay. About, okay. about this transition from from oil to solar in your plan. Um, I like the overall idea of, of doing that. I guess they're starting with a lot of diesel in the system now for power generation. And so in your, your power generation contribution curve, you, you show that. Um, but I, I, I think I'm, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're now saying about the oil sector. Do, are you saying that they need to fully develop their oil sector, including refining, for example, the ability to produce diesel? And, and that that will that will consume foreign investment in the near term, so that they can't invest in solar. Yes, we will first begin by one hundred percent oil at the moment, and they are still waiting for investors to get uh, their oil reservations out, so that we can just uh, jump in and start with start off with the off grid systems until the at least the uh, the power is stabilized by uh, by getting uh, oil reserves out. Hmm. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. And that is time um, and time for the next team. Um, we're now going to give team 107, Print Energy, the floor. Um, go ahead and unmute and start presenting. Are the judges ready? Sorry. Um, just want to make sure the judges are ready for them to start. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Team Prince Energy from Algeria. And we are here to present to you our energy project in Nicaragua. Nicaragua is a country suffering from energy poverty with only 65% electrification rate. However, Nicaragua has a huge potential of renewable energy, especially geothermal and hydropower. Our main project consists of a geothermal plant with a capacity of 150 megawatts in the Casita San Cristobal volcano. We chose geothermal for its very high potential, besides its being one of the most sustainable and reliable energy sources in Nicaragua, and its relatively low construction cost per installed kilowatts. The project will go through three phases, site establishment, exploration, and production, with a duration of 48 months. The project construction will cost about $140 million in addition to 15 and to 40 kilometer long electricity, electricity grid with a cost of $350,000. The total cost of the project is estimated at $145 million and it will be loaned from the World Bank. The project construction will start in 2023 and end in 2028. The power plant will enter commission in 2029. The geothermal plant will provide an estimated annual electricity generation of 300 to 350 gigawatt hours that will supply the near areas populated with over 400,000 people. We estimated, we estimated the profits from the electricity sold from the power plant with, two, with $20 million a year. All the profits will be used to repay the loan, and by 2036, the loan will be fully paid back. After 2036, the profits will be used in improving the capacity of the power plants until 225 megawatts and for future energy projects. For the rural area, we proposed mini hydropower plants for four rural villages nearby the Rio Prince of Polka River with a considerable capacity of 50 kilowatts for each one. Mini hydropower plants will be around 0 0.5 to $1 million with an annual generation of around 70 megawatt hours a year for each one, which is more than enough to power all the people there. After executing the project, Nicaragua will be 75% electrified with an annual electricity generation of 300 uh, of three terawatt hours, with one half of it being generated from renewable resources. Our project will decrease CO2 emissions, boost the economy and local businesses, improve public health and education, in addition to raising awareness among the local population about the dangers of firewood cooking inside the house and help transition to cooking with electrical stoves if possible. Thank you. Uh, we can start with the question now, with the questions. Great, thank you. Dr. Pockrell, would you like to take the first question? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, you have estimated the electricity generation cost uh, for your project as 10 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, right? Um, I, I wonder if people um, in the rural area of Nicaragua uh, can pay their electricity bill uh, for cooking, for example. Um, 
Uh, would there be any subsidy for cooking or heating you're considering or is there any such plans? Thank you. Uh, do you mean uh, uh, how will we how will we uh, uh, how will the rural villages uh, pay the fees of the electricity? Yeah, ten cents per kilowatt hour seems uh, yeah. fancy. Uh, for the rural, the other country. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we get it. Uh, for the rural villages, uh, we will not uh, make them pay the electricity. The mini hydropower plants will be uh, for free for the villages, and uh, they they will be just for. Uh, Making the lives better and introduce them to the to the electricity sector and uh, and provide more opportunities uh, for them in the education and uh, improve the health situation and uh, just uh, to get them uh, involved with uh, the electricity sector and the energy field. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Stoner, would you like to take the next question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's my dog barking in the background that you hear. Um, a, a nice presentation, a nice plan. I really liked uh, your focus on geothermal and taking advantage of that domestic resource. And, and also your cooking, your cooking focus, using electricity for cooking in order to sort of forestall uh, the, the use of biomass um, and, and your payback plan. What I, and you even talked about distribution, which is unusual. Uh, so con kudos for that, Have, stringing up the wires to connect people. What I didn't really understand though is how the distribution uh, system development that you, you plan to do is integrated into your financial plan and, and how that's paid back. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that, please? Uh, well, uh, for the electricity grid, uh, the, the cost of the electricity grid isn't uh, that high and it's uh, already integrated into the total budget where we said that uh, the, the total cost of construction is 140 US million dollars uh, and the total grid will uh, cost uh, between $350,000 to $500. Uh, dollars. And the, we loan $145 million. So those extra $4 million will be in case uh, we had some uh, trouble with the electricity grid. I see. But, but the geothermal, the 150 watt megawatt geothermal is, I thought you said serving 400,000 people. That sounds like a, it would take more than a couple of million dollars to build a distribution system at that scale. Well, uh, well the cities are near, uh, are near the geothermal power plant. Well, oh. and, uh, there are major cities uh, nearby it with the only 15 to 30 kilometers. And my friend Khalil can add. Yeah, uh, there's already uh, an electricity distribution system in those cities. We'll just extend uh, some more electricity generation to them to uh, provide this for, uh, for more villages there, for more uh, citizens there. Okay, that's great. So it's really just a matter of terminology. What you're really talking about is transmission rather than distribution, because you have to transport the energy from the geothermal site to the existing distribution grid. So that's great. That clears it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Moscardelli, uh, would you like to take the third question? Sure. Um, you, you know, in, in your funding scheme, you, you mentioned entities uh, such as the World Bank and also private uh, investors. Um, I, I was wondering, especially given the, the, the time right now with presidential elections and all uh, what's happening in Nicaragua, what, what is your opinion on the country risk? How, how do you think uh, politics could play a role in, in financing? Do, do you think there is a risk in there in terms of um, the investment of, of private, the private sector, the willingness to, to invest? And how would you address that? Or what do you think the risk is? Well, uh, uh, we are aware of the current political uh, problems in Nicaragua. However, uh, in the last 20 years, Nicaragua was one of the safest countries in Central America since uh, the, the civil war that happened in the 70s. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, what's happening now will, uh, will uh, how to say it? Uh, will, well, I'll go ahead, Khadi, please. I can also add to that that uh, there's already uh, have been uh, a geothermal power plant uh, built uh, uh, recently. 
and uh, it was very successful. It's still generating electricity until now. Uh, so yeah, by the company of Polaris. Uh, so uh, I think if they didn't have any problems uh, uh, building this plant, uh, so shouldn't we? Thanks. So, so, so you think that private investors will, will have the confidence to invest in the country under the current uh, political environment? Well, uh, well, yeah, yeah. As, uh, also, an additional information is that Nicaragua is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So, uh, with five percent uh, uh, growing factor, so I think that this presents a big uh, economical uh, and business uh, opportunity for them. Uh, even though the current uh, problems, however, I think that uh, the problem will go away in the politics. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, besides, that, I can add to that that uh, even if we uh, don't uh, get uh, pr private investors uh, contributing uh, to uh, uh, to uh, our financing, uh, that shouldn't be a problem because the World Bank can actually uh, uh, contribute a lot in uh, in uh, loaning us uh, the amount of money since they have already uh, uh, given uh, to uh, Nicaragua uh, loans before. Thank you, guys. We do have time for one more short question if any of the judges would like to ask something else. Okay, sounds like all of the questions have been answered. We can move on to the next team. Team 122, Energy Caribbean Alliance from Colombia, please prepare to share your screen and unmute and start presenting. Okay, you can see my screen. Uh, hello, we are Caribbean Energy Alliance from Colombia and we want to present to you Managua, a mini hydro project for Nicaragua, which was our select country. 40% of Nicaragua's population is rural and is located in the East Coast, where only 71% have access to electricity. Poverty has the same spatial distribution that match with the off-grid national system, which is unreliable due to it presents 40% losses caused by the supply system. The off-grid electrification consists mainly of installing diesel mini-grids and Managua project seeks to reduce the imports and use of fossil fuels. For the rural population, the solution proposal is a mini hydro net. The advantages over other energy sources are high level of predictability, great capacity factor, a slow rate of change, finally, does not contribute to any carbon emission, and additionally, is not weather dependent, and their energy storage is not expensive. Despite the potential on geothermal energy, the plant's construction is uh, is expensive and also the volcanic source are far away from the population of interest that is in the east, and this will increase the cost of transmission. Nicaragua has a great potential to develop mini hydro. There are 16 watersheds located over the region of interest, and their mean precipitation values uh, permit a good recharge. We compute the total, the total power needed to supply Nicaragua rural population based on an estimation of the monthly energy consumption per household, assuming the list of appliances shown here, where we also take into account energy losses by transmission as other needs. We project that for 2052, there will be almost 100,000 disconnected households that will require a power capacity of approximately 13 megawatt, which can be provided from 30 identified sites that in a P50 scenario will be able to produce at least 0.5 megawatt per site. We propose a three GR plan where there will be constructed 26 mini hydro plants and an electrical grid to address the main issues of Nicaragua the energy production and the lack of infrastructure to distribute it. The cost of the basis of prefeasibility and construction were calculated assuming $1,700 per kilowatt of energy. And based on that calculation, we select three development financial institutions that had invested in projects developed in Nicaragua. The plan also includes when and how much this institution will invest and when to repay the investment. At the end, the install capacity will be 13 megawatts. We calculate the levelized cost of energy to compare the performance of our proposal according to the initial investment, operation, and maintenance cost and other parameters. Our calculated LCOE of $0.06 per kilowatt per hour is competitive with other sources of energy. 
At the end, we expect to impact four areas, increase the use of renewable energy and employment rates, rates, ensure access to communication and education, and finally, enhance public health quality. We would like to invite you to dive into Managua project. Thank you. Thank you, Team 122. Um, we will now go into the Q&A. Dr. Stoner, if you'd like to start us off. Sure, yeah, thank you. Nice plan again. Um, again, you know, I, I understand that your focus here is on uh, dealing with this rural deficit, uh, both in terms of generation and in distribution. And I think that you covered that very nicely uh, in your in your plan. But but you didn't seem to pay much attention to the urban uh, demand as well, which the previous team spends a lot of time thinking about. Uh, you dismissed geothermal as as a potential resource to use in providing urban demand. So I'd like to I'd like to come back to that. But I guess my first question is about the pace of the rollout of the of the rural system. Uh, you're taking almost 30 years to roll out a couple of tens of megawatts of, of mini hydro. And, and I wonder why it takes so long. What's 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 limiting it in your thinking? Why can't it be done in five years or 10 years? Sorry, uh, you're talking about the, the time that we take to, to pay the the debt? No, the time that you take to build it. This one, yeah. Build. Yeah, I think that's what this is, right? This is the construction and, okay. and roll up time. Okay, so taking that into account, uh, we reviewed uh, a lot of uh, informs of uh, factibility of uh, mini hydro plants and usually, uh, on, on places like Nicaragua, I mean, uh, countries of Latin America and Caribbean region, uh, it is important to uh, focus a lot on the profitability phase. And for that reason, uh, we estimate that that part will uh, imply 40 years of, of investigation. Also, the construction phase uh, will have similar uh, time, will spend the similar time uh, based on the topographic uh, environment that Nicaragua, Nicaragua has, and where it's really similar to other countries in the region. Okay. All right. And then, and then on the, the other question that I was, I was uh, suggesting, um, am I correct that, that you, have, you have not really uh, devoted any of your plan to urban capacity that you've yes. solely focused on this okay yes that's right because as as we saw the urban population of nicaragua the the efforts of the nicaragua's government are are towards the urban population so they right now they are they have like 99 percent of electricity rates in the urban population and mm -hmm. as we see we have to to be to be like focused in the places where the the access to electricity is lower like in the rural area as we can see if, for example in this in this graphic the access to to electricity in the rural area is about 70 percent that is really really low uh, compared mm -hmm. with 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 the with the rate to Latin with Latin America, right? So that's the access problem, but but won't demand also grow? You mentioned the growth rate being, or the previous group four or five percent per year, of GDP won't won't demand increase over the thirty year period of the plan, and won't they need more power? Okay, so uh, talking about a uh, that increase, uh, we add this appendix when we estimate how much energy will need every year, the rural areas will need every year. So as you can see, uh, here we have uh, uh, the rural population and uh, the houses that are in those areas and how they will uh, increase over every year at, uh, based on our tier to year plan. Okay, all right, well, let me not take up all the time. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thank you. Dr. Moscadelli, if you'd like to go next. Uh, sure. Um, I have several questions, but let's see. Um, 
in in your estimations for you know energy energy consumption consumption needs, uh, I think you show a table. Um, I, I, I see the list here and, and you mentioned that other needs uh, were linked to uh, power loss. That's what you, that, that's what you mentioned uh, during the presentation. Yeah, when we mention other needs, we're talking about exactly energy losses and other fact, uh, another kind of type of, of appliances, like for example, oven or something like that. That's why we, we estimate that in other needs, we are going to need at least 20 to 30% more than, than this list of appliances here. Yeah, because I, I guess my question was into the lines of, of being these rural areas, you know, cooking might be a big issue. So I was wondering what was your approach uh, in, or, or if you add that into your estimations. Yeah, so, we, 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 we think that that kind of that, that kind of issue can be attacked or addressed by other by the other needs that we are that we are specifying here. Okay. So the other question that I had in the financing part, um, where are, I think you show a slide, but it was too fast. But you're relying mainly in financing from which entities? Are, are you relying in, on the private sector as well? Or what, what's your no, plan there? We assume, we believe uh, that uh, these three uh, development banks as the, as the BID, the World Bank, and the other one, which is BCIE, which is a development bank that uh, operates in the a central part of America and in which uh, Nicaragua is a, a real important member are, are the ones that can uh, give us the money to, to produce these plants. Why? Because these entities uh, had invested in other uh, projects, not just about energy, but other kinds of projects. Uh, with similar uh, amounts of investment on Nicaragua in the past. And just very briefly, I'm just curious, what's your take on uh, country risk? Can you repeat your question, please? What's your take on, on country risk, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of how this investment could be returned to, to, the, to the banks? Uh, but when I talk about country risk, I'm, I'm talking, you know, um, the framework, the legal framework in the country that would allow uh, these entities to, to recoup money or, you know. Yeah, so as we know, the government that uh, is operating right now in Nicaragua uh, has been there for more than 10 years. And in those years, uh, those institutions that we can see here, for instance, the World Bank and the BCIE uh, had invested there. Uh, so they, they have like a strong uh, legal framework in which those institutions can invest. And obviously uh, Nicaragua had to repay to them based on the projects that uh, they have already established there. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you. All right, and Dr. Pockerell, um, there's about two minutes left in the Q&A. Oh yeah, um, well, thank you for, you know, um, mentioning uh, reducing debts related to household debt pollution on your impact uh, project. Um, but as uh, previous has asked, uh, on your power uh, capacity needed slide, you have not included um, electricity uh, required for cooking. Um, are you considering another energy mix uh, for cooking and heating? Um, because I'm wondering if heating energy would also be required. Although, although we didn't mention exactly the cooking, like the cooking sector in the in our consumption estimation, we assume that in other needs they are going to be addressed, and this is one of the impacts that we want to produce that is reducing to zero the deaths related to household air pollution that are associated with cooking with the the habits that Nicaragua population has had cooking with biomass in the in, inside houses. So you're considering to replace. Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah, the solid fuel and then uh, introduce only uh, electricity based cooking here. Yeah. Thank you. 
So obviously, um, uh, implementing this kind of projects there, when they will be a reliable source of energy uh, will uh, boost the willingness the population will have in order to replace uh, these kinds of, of materials for cooking in order to use uh, electricity, which is uh, cheaper and reliable. Thank you. We also think that this kind of project has have to have like. Sorry to cut you off, but that's ten minutes, so we need to end and go to the next team. Okay. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you, Team One Twenty Two and the judges. Um, <clears throat> um, team One Thirty Three, Zas, <clears throat> please prepare to unmute and share your screen. Um, I just want to confirm yeah. with all the judges: Are you ready for the next presentation? Yes. 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 Perfect. Team 133, go ahead. Okay, I'm clear. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. South Sudan is now not countering East Africa that suffered from political conflict, lack of security, and energy poverty, with only 1% having access to modern energy. However, it's rich in resources, which has led to us developing our solution plan. The studies by taking along from Egypt. Then we'll build a biogas system followed by solar power plants in order to improve the quality of life. Starting from Europe, we'll build a biogas system, which depends on the cow waste provided by the local residents, which will produce electricity in addition to biogas and fertilizers, which will be sold for extra profit. We choose biogas as it's renewable, and it's also safe. And it's the perfect way to utilize the vast population of cattle in South Sudan. Our selling price would be the cheapest compared to the other countries in the region. And we, we, our first income will be in 2022, which is, go, which is going to increase in only 10 years to become $6.8 billion per month. As for the solar power plants, our project will be in LOL, which has the highest rate of sunlight. Then our plan will be to improve the quality of life by building the community necessities and expanding from more up to the rest of the country. Our solution pipeline plan consists from four phases. The first phase is from the law and the law of 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 the law And the law of 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 the law the second of the law of the the same that we did in the first phase, but in law of the law of the law of the law of the the law of 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 Increasing the number of systems uh, like electricity, uh, pipelines, water treatment, and uh, take care of education and health. At the end of this phase, we will be able to supply the needs from biogas, water, and the hot houses and electricity for all the population. And when I say the population, I mean the population at the end of our project, which will be 20.3 million systems. Not the population is part of our project. And all our calculations are in this number of each. And in the third phase, we will replace huts by buildings and increase the number of schools and those. And in the last phase, we are checking all the systems and improving the systems and the building we have done in the last 30 years. And the road will be started to be built. And the, the according to the problem of lack of food and work of the citizens, we will make them work on our building projects to increase their income so they can plant there. Farms. And uh, starting from 2074, the GDP will be uh, 82.6 billion dollar, which 20 times the GDP in 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Team 133. Uh, we'll now uh, move ahead to the Q and A portion. Dr. Moscadelli, if you'd like to start. Sure. Um... Um, from your main presentation, uh, you know, I was a little bit confused about the, the funding scheme. Um, I, I think you mentioned that uh, Egypt was going to be the, the, the main uh, funding um, source. And, and you, you mentioned, I think, in, in one of your introductory slides that you were counting on $100,000 uh, to, to kickstart this uh, with intention to, 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 to return 300000 after a year or something like that. But is that enough to develop uh, all, all, all this? How, how is that going to work? Uh, OK, so uh, first of all, in our project management, we, we search for a project that needs the least 
amount of loan as uh, there's risk in South Sudan and there's no many investors. So we researched that Egypt is one of the main investors. And we also researched the, the biogas generator that costs the less compared to the profit that we will gain from the outcomes of our biogas generator. So $1,000 was enough and we will return after one year as part of the biogas and solid fertilizers will be sold for profit. So that we will return the loan 20, uh, 200%, which is 300K. And the remaining profit of our project, we will, uh, we will take it to expand our own project. So it, in our calculation, it was more than enough. And we, and we think it will, it will work. What's, what's the cost of one of these uh, biogas uh, generators? Uh, it, it, it was uh, the cost uh, with the workers and, and the tanks that would be distributed was all around like uh, $79,000. 79000 so, Yes. So you, you, you're starting with just one, uh, one biogas. biogas. Yes, we're starting with one biogas. And after one year, we'll be able to build the other one from the profit as the electricity will be given to the citizens. A fourth of the biogas will be also given to the citizen, but the remaining will be sold, and the solid fertilizer will be also sold. For do, you, do you have projections on how that income will look like over five, ten years? Yes, it was in our uh, BDF. In the end of the and we increase after a massive increase because we build a much more biogas systems. But some of this biogas we will to supply the need for citizens. So okay, so, so 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 maybe that yeah we can we can move to just a quick question here. Um, this is highly dependent on on the collection of of cow, cow's waste to get to the to the to the plants. How, what's the logistics behind how that collection is going to happen? Who's going to take that waste to to this to this place? Okay, so uh, our uh, our collection plan is to distribute tons to the families. As in South Sudan, each family has an average of three cows. So we'll ask them to collect the waste, and there will, we also. A added the cost of delivery, which would be take the taking of the tank and then delivering it to our biogas generating system. Okay, thanks. Th those are my questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Pakrell, if you'd like to take the next question. Yeah, thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, as a follow up, uh, if I'm correct, you're you're planning on selling the biogas, right? You want to sell, um, and oh, how? Would you do that it's through pipeline or you would refill uh, gas and cylinder? And uh, if you want to refill the gas cylinder to sell it, you need a refilling plant, right? Which would require more than $50,000. So what's your plan of uh, selling bagas? How would you do that? Okay, so uh, the we, we could sell it through tanks or pipeline, but either way, uh, our selling costs what wasn't including the, the the transport of it so the seller is the one who is in charge if you want to take it as a pipeline or tank so we leave it up to our customer who is gonna buy it okay i, I hope it's clear okay and dr stoner if you'd like to take the third question yeah thank you um, it's an interesting plan. I'm, I'm going to start investing in biogas if it's as profitable as it seems to be. But, but you know, I, I had a little bit of trouble understanding um, a lot that you described in your plan about other infrastructure, schools, universities, hospitals, and so on. Is, is, where's the money coming from for that? Is that, is that all part of the sort of uh, overall financing scheme, or is that happening separately? Can you explain that? Come from biogas. Bio all from the biogas. All completely. Because of biogas, you can uh, reduce every one for 125k per month. Hmm. And yearly, it uh, may be equal to 1.5 million dollars. And we built more than 55k biogas for profit. So we have a massive income, which uh, will reach 6.8 million dollars per month. And we started by 
building schools and clinics, all they are the cheapest thing we can build in the start because we have lack of money. And in the second phase, we built a lot of things because our income has increased very much, and that's how we have our income completely from bigger. That's not more. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understand that. I understood that. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're we welcome, do have sir. we do have time for one more question. If there are any follow up questions, any of the judges would like to ask. Okay, in that case, we can move on to the next team. Thank you very much. And our last team is team 151, Urge Affinity. Um, <clears throat> if you guys are ready, you can unmute and share your screen. Yeah, I'd like to ask Ayush to go ahead and share his screen. Hello everyone, we are Team Oja Affinity from India, and this is our case study on Nepal. As this diagram portrays, Nepal needs to function properly on energy and economy, the two wheels that drive each other to bring about proper prosperity. Nepal has a majorly rural population comprising 79% of the total, and they have suffered from energy crisis for a while now. Here are the problems we identified. Despite having electricity access, reliability is a major issue in Nepal. The utility grid is overloaded, making reliable supply unaffordable. For cooking fuel, the majority of the population uses biomass and cooking without proper ventilation leads to cardiovascular diseases and only a small fraction can have access to clean fuel. Hence, lack of proper energy access restricts economic growth and affects quality of life. Coming to the solution, we have divided our solution into four salient paths, off-grid, on-grid, clean cooking and economy. For off-grid, solar power will be opted as a solution aided by the low interest loans with a provision to sell the extra electricity produced. For on-grid, transmission and distribution losses will be minimized through upgradation to better infrastructure, and solar-pumped hydro plants will handle peak load balance. Transition from traditional to clean cooking will be endorsed, and biogas plants will be set up as the optimal fuel for Nepal. Solar cookers will be promoted as zero-cost fuel appliances, and improved cook stoves will be endorsed to tra as transition aid. For economic growth, regional electricity export channels with India and China will be boosted, and the revenues generated can be reinvested, and local industries will, will be encouraged by endorsement of low-cost solar mini-grids. FDI will be sought from these China-based companies for the off-grid solar projects. Let's discuss the final, financial aspect of the project now. We have displayed how the various projects will be financed, with loans being taken from the indigenous Nepalese banks to the World Bank. The simplified cost to households per annum has been shown, which is our primary metric. As you can see, the cost to households are astronomically low, taking off the financial burden from the people. Payoff periods range from 5 to 30 years amongst the various projects. The detailed implementation timeline is given here. The 30 year period has been split into three 10 year phases with the various stages of the solution with their expenses listed here. The factors refer to the detailed plan in the original presentation. Now, the most important part with this project, we are aiming to achieve UN Sustainable Development Goals 3 and 7. We intend to reduce carbon, carbon emissions with our proposal that promotes renewable energy entirely. Quality of life will improve and life expectancy will increase. Encouraging local industrial growth will attract FDI and better electricity access will give a boom to the tourism sector. Our intention was to make Nepal a self-sufficient country with potential export electricity and give cleaner, sustainable energy alternatives. With this plan, we are confident we have done so. With this, we rest our case. Thank you, Switch. Thank you, Team 151. We'll now move on to the Q&A portion. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Popperl, if you'd like to start us off. Oh, thank you. Uh, nice presentation. Um, so on your proposal um, on the presentation, you have proposed to sell electricity generated uh, from solar, uh, you know, but uh, households um, in Karnali district are very scattered. Um, and yes. even the transformers are very far. Uh, that's why there is a problem of um, voltage fluctuation. Um, given such situation, you know, what kind of technology uh, could households use uh, to sell electricity uh, from solar? Uh, do you have any technology in mind? Um, um, uh, well, right off the- technology? Yeah, yeah, well, right off the bat, we had to uh, take out a uh, grid connection from the equation because it's uh, not feasible given the terrain of Nepal, especially in the Karnali province. Uh, we thought about a uh, uh, kind of a financial arrangement between uh, like inter-community exchange where uh, people who like uh, from one community who are generating excess electricity can use it as a barter system in exchange for other products and services, given if there are any communal functions happening or some other energy 
they can purchase like they can uh, gather energy from uh, focusing on batteries to do that uh, 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 the, for the uh, storing the energy and uh, for basically exchanging it for people and I, I guess my teammate would like to add to that if possible um ayush anything to add to that no, i think you had covered all all the aspects sir right yeah that so that's it. Uh, no no uh, no specific technology as such uh, we haven't kept it in mind because uh, we are still open to other inventions. Uh, we all, for all we know, uh, solar energy is a, a fastly uh, developing uh, technology. So we are hoping that something will come up. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Stoner. If you'd like to take the next question. Yeah, sure. Well, I loved your 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 plan and your presentation. I thought it had real energy, uh, and you covered all the bases very nicely. So congratulations on that. Um, you covered all the bases so comprehensively that it was it was hard for me to pick up the details of the financing plan. And one of the aspects you talked about was the large amount of subsidy that was going to be provided for the off grid. Right. I I couldn't connect I couldn't connect that subsidy with the financial plan as I was able to grasp it from the slides as they flew by. Could you can you explain how the subsidies are are folded into the plan? Uh, yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, we wanted to go with uh, indigenous Nepalese banks with this uh, for the financing to start off with. Uh, we went to the NIB, NMB and the civil bank. Uh, yeah, the financing basically uh, comes down to the fact that uh, we are asking them for, uh, we are basically subsidizing 75% of the initial cost. People will, will be required to pay 25% of the installation cost upfront and the rest will be divided into the uh, development, the, uh, developing 10 year period, the coming 10 year period, which has been divided into three phases. So uh, the the ten year period will be given to them for to pay off the rest, and uh, basically it uh, it comes down to a uh, it drops down quite uh, quite a bit the simplified cost to a particular house, household, uh, and uh, only twenty five percent needs to be paid up front, and the seventy five percent rest will be like uh, endorsed by a loan with as with very low interests basically, and they have got these provisions going on already. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Got it. Thank you. And then Dr. Moscardelli, if you'd like to take the third question. Sure. Um, nice presentation. I, I really enjoy it. Um, at some point in, in, in your presentation, you, you talk about reducing dependence on, on, on fossil fuels, I think, on the, on the long version. Um, right. But um, how uh, would you envision that proportion of uh, decreasing, uh, you know, your the, the, the Nepal's dependence on hydrocarbons in comparison with uh, the other uh, alternatives that you're proposing. What's what's that ratio in through time? Uh, uh, was the ratio in? Would you repeat that? Was that uh, ratio through time? You know, like uh, oh, right. twenty twenty versus twenty thirty versus twenty forty. Uh, okay, so. Uh... Uh, Nepal, uh, particularly, it imports most of its uh, oil, uh, like uh, fossil fuels from India because it has no indigenous resources. So that's basically a part of a regional cooperation deal that has made with India. So its dependence, we could not completely eradicate it because uh, of uh, other, other political implications. But yeah, uh, we assume that with uh, with uh, more cost-effective EVs coming into play by mid 2030s, uh, we can predict that uh, its uh, eradication, uh, its dependence on fossil fuels will. Uh, uh, pretty much uh, will go down by a lot. So uh, and and most so of you, you, don't, you don't have a number. You don't have a percentage. You you didn't project or calculate try to calculate uh, well, that. What, what's the, what's well, the dependence? Well, what's the dependence? Right dependence now, of hydrocarbons right now. Right now, six percent. Six percent of its energy consumption is met by uh, uh, fossil fuels. Only six percent is dependent on all on hydrocarbons. I, I mean, we. I have a bar chart. Uh, I have a pie chart in place. Uh -huh. If you can see that. Uh, sorry, my bad. My bad. It's uh, twelve point five percent. Okay. So, so yeah. I mean, it's dependence particularly on uh, like uh, LPG as cooking fuel will be eradicated because we are proposing uh, biogas to take up that pace. And uh, yeah, uh, and we we wanted to switch to EVs earlier, but the fact is the horsepower required to navigate through the difficult terrain on North Nepal can't be met by any EVs that are cost effective for their population at this point of time. So, but with the boost in economy that is going to be brought about by the other projects, we hope uh, it will become a possible it will it will become a, a, a possible option for them in the future. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. And we do have time for one more question. If any of the judges have a follow-up question. Uh, can I ask one question? Um, yeah, please. please. Uh, so you have proposed a, you know, a solar uh, cooker um, as yeah. an option, but uh, given the you know eating habits of uh, people in India and Nepal, uh, people prefer to fry rather than boil. Um, do you think solar cooker would work um, in such uh, environments where people prefer to fry rather than boil? Uh, well, what our motivation, yeah, 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 well, our motivation regarding uh, uh, promoting the solar cooker was the fact that uh, it, uh, due to Nepal having a great EV potential, uh, 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 the solar solar cooker would basically be a zero cost full appliance. Uh, uh, you are right, correct about the eating habits. They do uh, want to, they, they, they do prefer frying rather than boiling. But we do have uh, the provision of biogas plants for that for the rest of the energy requirements. It's just a, it's just uh, 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 like we thought uh, it would be a good thing to promote uh, the use of solar cookers uh, so that people know that there are various alternatives to go for. And one of them, which requires basically all you have to do is put it out in the sun and your food gets cooked. And it's always better to switch to healthy eating habits, don't you think? Yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. All right. Any other questions from the judges? We have about two minutes left. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at this point, I will set up a breakout room for the judges and Olivia to go into, and um, I will do that right now and invite you all in there. And then we will have a little bit of um, a video presentation and share some information while they're tallying up their scores. And then we will present the winners. Okay. Have you all received the invitation to the breakout room? All right, perfect. All right, well, thank you so much teams. Um, now all the judges are calculating their final scores. I would like to play a video for you. We asked members of teams who didn't make it to the final round to submit an optional testimonial about what participating in the case competition meant to them. We received several responses, which we will play for you now. We'll also post this video on the Switch Energy Alliance Facebook page and our case competition Facebook group after the final. So if you'll just bear with me while I get that video going. My apologies, I'm having trouble finding the file. It is. I had everything prepared, but my organization backfired on me a bit. All right, I think I should have it now. Here is Mohammed Rahouli, a participant of the second energy switch case competition. I'm really extremely excited to be part of this great experience with my team, Davis Squad in Egypt. Actually, we learned a lot through this experience about energy poverty and how this is a problematic issue that 2.5 billion people still have little access to energy or no access to energy at all. 
and how these people need more attention from us as being a graduate researcher and master students researchers and we actually learned how to address such an issue not only from an engineering and energy oriented solutions but also from a political and economic solutions actually we have learned a lot and i believe that this experience will benefit my future career especially my academic one as being a a research graduate students at the University of Tokyo in Japan and I believe it would also give me an aid when applying for future opportunities in the energy industry. Thank you Switch Energy team. Hello everyone, I am Ravi and I am a part of Team Zeta from India. As of now, we have been selected in semi-final successfully. This competition gave us an opportunity to look into the energy problems faced by the world. In the process of finding solutions, we learnt a lot, which we never did or even supposed to learn via our conventional education system. I personally want to thank Swiss Energy Alliance for conducting or for giving us this opportunity and I hope our solutions will help the world. Thank you. <laughs> Three things. My name is Longkuru Lagontalose uh, from South Africa. I am currently doing mechanical, MSc Mechanical Engineering in Sustainable Energy. Uh, it has been a great honor to be part of SEA competition. Um, what I've learned is that there's a lot that needs to be done when it comes to um, renewable uh, energy. We are currently using a lot of um, non-renewable non energy. Uh, for electricity generation where else we can use our renewable uh, resources such as solar wind and etc so what i've learned is that uh, after my after my completion i would love to have sort of a program that i can develop uh, for people to learn more about the natural resources that we have that we can use for energy and for electricity generation because when we use our renewable uh, resources it means that the fuel is free we don't have to worry about buying a fuel and it means that the tariff will be low so i am looking forward for for that i'm looking forward to help africa in terms of understanding more uh, about the renewable resources that we have that we can utilize and yeah thank you <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much to the participants who submitted testimonials. Um, and I love interacting with all of our case competition team members. And I hope those of you who are eligible will participate again next year. And um, I'm also excited to announce that in addition to the prize money, all of our finalists are also eligible to apply for an internship opportunity. Um, the internship opportunity this year is with us at Switch Energy Alliance. We are seeking one intern to help us continue to grow and develop our international Switch Energy case competition along with our other educational programs such as energy clubs and Switch Classroom. This will be a part-time paid position and is perfect for someone who would like to interact with fellow students and engage with energy professionals from around the world. Our case competition volunteer this year, Syed Talhat-Jermizi, was an intern at SCA last year, working remotely from his home in Pakistan. That experience helped influence his decision to become a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. Talha, can you tell us a little bit about more about your experience as an intern and how that helped shape your decision to pursue a degree at UT? Thank you so much, Mary, for a very nice introduction. Thank you so much for introducing me. And hello, everyone. I am Sayyid Talhat Tirmizi, and I have worked as an intern for Switch Energy Alliance in organizing the international switch energy case competition 2021 and this year i'm also volunteering to organize the international switch energy case competition i'm also studying ms petroleum engineering at the hildebrand department of petroleum 
and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, USA. I enjoyed my internship at Switch Energy Alliance and now have a very valuable experience under my belt. I personally believe that the quality internships are essential to develop key skills that you cannot get in the classroom. Skills such as multitasking, communicating, learning to deal with diversity and dealing with the de deadlines are so different when you are working in an organization rather than just working in a classroom or college. This internship also provided a best way to communicate and network with people belonging to different cultures across continents. It helped me a lot to re reinforce my knowledge of responsibility, focus, drive, and ambition. And this internship opportunity, most importantly, also gave me an opportunity to meet and work with extraordinarily passionate and inspiring people. That includes Philip, Preston, Olivia, Mary, Dr. Scott Tinker, Mr. Bill Hayes, Ms. Corina, and Parker, and Sarah Jane, and so many enthusiastic members of the enthusiastic team of Switch Energy Alliance. We have been working behind the scenes for months to plan for the very last, every last detail of this competition and the determination and passion of the interns and the Switch Energy Alliance team is so inspirational. Uh, and an internship at Switch Energy Alliance also helped me in deciding my future goals as I got to know about the prestigious graduate program of the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT Austin, which, had, which, which supports the International Switch Energy Case Competition. So being able to see your contribution towards a noble cause of energy literate future and the significance of them was another perk of interning at Switch Energy Alliance. Energy poverty is no doubt a very huge challenge for all of us. There are countless stories on the suffering of families due to lack or inadequate energy access. Energy poverty impacts health and well being of human beings. Having the opportunity to do internship at Switch Energy Alliance, uh, interns have envisioned to tackle energy poverty by contributing energy literacy and inspiring the most cause aware this generation of human history so that no more families have to suffer through cold nights or scorching hot summer without energy access. So I would like to conclude by saying that the secret, a secret of getting ahead is getting started. So I would highly recommend the Switch Energy Alliance internship to all of you because this internship will give you a competitive edge and equip you for a bright future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Talha. Uh, really appreciate your kind words. Um, and we've loved having Talha as an intern and we love continuing to work with him as a volunteer. So thank you so much. Um, and I will reach out to all finalists soon with more details about the internship and information on how to apply, or you can go ahead and email me directly. Okay, um, and finally, I'd like to say a few words to close out our case competition. This was my first year running the International Switch Energy Case Competition, and I want to say what an honor and a joy it has been to interact with all of you. I am so impressed and humbled by the hard work, creativity, and effort that our participants showed in their proposals. I've learned so much from all of you, and I hope that you learned a lot during this competition as well. Even if you didn't make it to the semifinals or finals round, I hope this was a positive experience and I hope to hear from you all again. And to our finalists, a huge congratulations to you all. 
The competition this year was strong and it's an incredible achievement to have made it this far. To our volunteer judges and mentors, thank you so much for giving us your time and expertise. I know I've said it about a hundred times before, but truly this competition could not happen year after year without the help of dedicated Switch Energy Alliance supporters like you. You are what makes all of our successes possible. Thank you to our finals judges in particular, Dr. Lorena Moscardelli, Dr. Ahmad Pockroll, and Dr. Rob Stoner for giving us their time this week and today. It was an honor having you all join us and I hope it was an enjoyable experience. A big thank you to our financial supporters as well. Chuck and Kathy Williamson gave a large donation to the case competition this year and the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin repeated their gift from last year, allowing us to substantially increase the prize package for finalists this year. Dr. John Olson from, the Hildebrand, from Hildebrand PGE also hosted our panel discussion this year, which was a great success. I'd also like to thank my case competition the team Thank you to my co-host and SEA intern, Olivia Rickard, for attending and hosting every 9 a.m. Saturday event during this competition and for being a huge help with student outreach. Thank you as well to our SEA volunteer, Syed Talha Termizi, for supporting us with his experience and technical expertise. Thank you to Parker Donaldson for preparing the slides, videos, and other media for our live events and for helping to prepare the case packet this year on a very tight timeline. Thank you to Philip Bolton and Preston Bonchill, who unfortunately could not join us today for writing the case prompt this year and sharing your experiences from last year with us. Thank you also to Marissa Abramson with Argos Films for helping us with marketing and out outreach this year. And finally, I'd also like to thank Bill Hayes for pioneering the inaugural International Switch Energy Case Competition last year. None of this would, have, would be possible without his dedication to providing students an opportunity to learn about and engage with energy poverty and other important energy issues affecting the world today. And now without further ado, the judges scores have been tallied and we are ready to announce the results. All right, I am sharing my screen. All right, here are the results. Um, in fifth place, we have team 133, um, Zas, congratulations. And in fourth place, we have team 101, Energizers 4. Congratulations to team 101. And in third place, we have team 107, Print Energy. Congratulations, guys. Second place, we have Team 122, Energy Caribbean Alliance. Great job, great presentations. And in first place, we have Team 151, Urge Affinity from India. Thank you guys so much. You guys did amazing. Yay, that's so exciting. Congratulations to all of the finalist teams. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I'm just so, so proud of you guys. Um, great, great job. Um, for some concluding remarks, as I leave this screen up, um, this has been an extremely exciting finals event. Um, once again, congratulations to all the finalists. Um, everyone has worked very hard to make it here, and it's nice to see that all your hard work has paid off. Um, uh, in addition, you've uh, to the prize money, you've gained invaluable information about your chosen country's energy situation and your newfound perspective on global energy poverty. And this is the mission of Switch Energy Alliance to educate people on the impacts of energy poverty and then to encourage the development of solutions. Um, and as an organizer, I had a great time getting to watch and interact with your presentations. So thank you to all the participants for your passion to help make this world a more energy secure place. And thank you to all the mentors, preliminary round judges, semi-finals judges, and our three finalist judges here today. This competition would not have been possible without your support and insight. Yes, uh, we hope this has been an enjoyable and educational experience for both the participants and volunteers. In order to continue to improve our case competition, we will be sending out a short survey to the participants and volunteers about the competition this year. 
please complete it and let us know if you have any suggestions that we could implement in the coming years. Uh, once again, congratulations to the finalists and thank you everyone for participating in the 2021 International Switch Energy Case Competition. We hope you can take what you've learned here and go on to make the world a more ethical, equitable, and sustainable place. Until next time, stay safe and be well. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Congratulations, thank you. everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Amazing you. job. Thank you.